Uh, welcome to HBCU to Startup. And this week we have Stephanie, who is the CEO and founder of Blendor. Um, so one thing that's really cool that I just mentioned to Stephanie is that she is on the road hustling right now, but is still joining <laughs> us, <laughs> which is really cool. So where are you? So I'm in DC. Um, th there was an organization called Black Data Processing Associates oh, yeah. uh -huh. that that honored me with an award last night. So literally just flew in and participated in their awards gala. And now I am trying to catch up on mm -hmm. West Coast, East Coast time, but very, very excited to be back on the East Coast for the time <laughs> being. Okay. And you go back and forth, right? So you're, you're located both on the East Coast and the West Coast. Yeah, but my headquarters is definitely in San Francisco. Oh, I, okay. I, yeah, I'm very, very excited about the fact that we have an office in San Francisco. About 80% of my companies are based in Silicon Valley, so it is important for me to be there, but my roots are definitely here on the East Coast. Okay. And so we kind of just jumped in, but do you want to give yourself like a brief introduction about yourself, a little background, and then we could talk about Blendor? Sure. So um, as we mentioned, born and raised in uh, the D.C. metro area. Um, what's unique about my story is that um, my mother was actually homeless when she was pregnant with me. So we ended up in D.C. because my auntie was majoring in computer science at the mm -hmm. University of Maryland College Park mm -hmm. in 1984. Wow. So ended up, right. <laughs> so ended up here and I started coding through an organization called Black Data Processing Associates, who just mm -hmm. recently gave me an award. But this was back in the mid 90s. So way mm -hmm. before Black Girls Code and Women Who Code and all of these like hackathons, like this has been going on for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got started. Um, so ultimately, you know, participating in these conferences, these events around um, getting more African-Americans in technology, it led my trajectory into computer science and engineering, went to Stanford, got an engineering degree, worked for Microsoft. Um, spent five years there, really didn't see the growth that I felt was needed. So I quit. Mm -hmm. Looks like we lost you for a second. And he got an MBA. The recruiter said to me, you know, we don't think you're quite technical enough but we're going to hang on to your resume in case the sales or marketing position opens up. So we, so, hold on, hold on a second. It looks like we lost you for a quick second. So can you go back and rewind? You, you, when we, you, we just came back in when you were talking about the recruiter said, so go back, which recruiter yeah. is this? Okay. Google. Google. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yep. yeah. So this Google go recruiter ahead. said you're underqualified for a technical position mm -hmm. basically. Um, so we're going to hang on to your resume mm -hmm. in case a sales or marketing position opens up. Okay. Um, and so that's when I kind of realized like all of this talk about schools, right? So, and, and actually this is really important for the, mm -hmm. the forum that we're currently in, because I think a lot of HBCU alumni feel like it's just them mm -hmm. that are being overlooked, mm -hmm. but with a Stanford and MIT degree, I was told that I was underqualified. Oh, wow. wow. So this is not an HBCU problem. Yeah. Um, and that's what, that's when I kind of realized like, okay, there's something going on here. Cause I feel like I had done the dog and pony show mm -hmm. and it still wasn't good enough. Still doing it. Um, and so that's kind of how, I think you're doing a mm -hmm. typical twice exactly. as good and it still didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I came up with the idea of, um, you know, this sort of like removing as much potential bias as possible in mm -hmm. this recruiting process. Okay. And so I'm just going to, for the 
there's a few viewers who just joined us, and so I'm just going to do a brief announcement. For those who are watching live now, you can ask your questions. There is a nine square icon at the top of your screen. If you click on that, you'll see a QA and a um, icon, and you can ask your questions uh, through there. So, okay, so tell us, so that's how you came to, came up with the idea to remove some of the biases. So where's Blender today? Um, what is it, you know, what, what is it, what does it do? How does mm -hmm. someone jump on the platform? Give us some information, some details. Absolutely. So Blender is very simple mm -hmm. um, in terms of how easily you can join. And we, we wanted to make it very appealable for people who just want to see you. Looks like we lost you again. It's like we play and we only show you. Hello? Yes, I can see you. Can you see me? Okay, yeah, I can see you. It looks like we lost okay. down for a second. Okay. Okay. So we're very much mimicking the experience of Tinder. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually call ourselves the anti Tinder. But in any case, you log on with LinkedIn or Facebook, we pull in all of your data, and we only show you jobs that are relevant to you. Mm -hmm. And so you swipe right, swipe left. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, recruiter sees your profile, but we hide your name and photo. Uh -huh. So they're only judging you based on how well you meet the requirements of the role. Mm -hmm. Swipe right, swipe left. Whenever there's a match between the candidate and recruiter, each get a push notification where they can then message each other to set up a phone screening, interview, or formal application. Okay. So that's ultimately how the app works. Mm -hmm. We are, we've been in private beta for about this month. Okay. So anyone who goes onto our website and adds their email to our beta, they'll get a link to our official early We lost sound again. Um, um, right now we have about, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. We lost, we're go, going in and out. I think that's the, uh, that's the, when, you, when you're hustling, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you, you were saying that someone signs up and they uh, get a link to uh, pri to the private uh, beta. Yes. That's the link. Okay. Yes. And basically, we will only show you companies and jobs that you are actually matched with. Mm -hmm. And what type of um, jobs so do you have you on the platform right so now? So all across the board, mm -hmm. sales, legal, technical, Friendships full time, all across the board. Okay. We we're only targeting companies in tech. So, Airbnb, Uber. Yep. Really big. Tech. Okay. Are you there? It seems like yep, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Okay. Um. So how has the but how has the experience been so far in terms of starting up? Um, what are some of the wows or got you's that you've learned along the way? Looks like we lost you again. Of predominantly African Americans and women and since moving to the Bay, I, I have to be about um, people who have resources that may not be within my existing networks. Mm -hmm. First investors are, are in who you know, they're not people that 
been connected to through Stanford or through Digital Undivided or HBCU mm -hmm. Start or, or whatever organizations, so I realized that like I needed to um, broaden my scope mm -hmm. in order to really get the resources that I um, that's part of the reason why I left New York and moved mm -hmm. to San Francisco. Okay. And it has yielded amazing results. And I think, and I think that's a, that's a big challenge. Hey, hey, Stephanie, can you hear me? Hello. Of a comfort zone. Um, so for, it took a while, but in, in term. Hey, Stephanie, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hey, Stephanie. Uh huh. Do you you know what? Because like the sound keeps going in and out. Do you want to turn off the video and see if that helps with the sound? Sure. Okay. Okay. Is that better? So, yeah. So right now is better. So let's see how that works. Okay. Um, so okay. You, you were talking about the difference between New York and the Valley. Um, so what has been the main the main differences? The main difference between between um, like running a company in New York versus uh, bringing your startup to San Francisco or to or Silicon Valley. Yeah, great question. So I was saying how um, the the Valley tends to have a lot more people who are willing to take risk, mm -hmm. particularly because it. It's, traditionally, it's been pattern matching, right? If you're a white guy and you have an Asian co-founder and you're really smart and you went to Stanford or MIT, you're almost guaranteed success. Mm -hmm. But I think we're at a really great point where investors are realizing that that is not the recipe for success. Mm -hmm. And actually, you need to look almost completely beyond what you think is success. Yeah. Um, so when I was in New York, I didn't get the feeling that they got that. Um, mm -hmm. but since being in the Valley, I've been given way more opportunities by people who do not look like me or do mm -hmm. not think like me <laughs> simply because they understand. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Simply be because they understand that, like, the demographics of our country is changing and the people who are failing are the same. Like, so I, I think we're at a very, um, a very important stage where people can take advantage of this diversity push if they do it in the right way. And I, I didn't Absolutely. feel that in New York. Absolutely. Um, and then so just real quick, we have some viewers who are just joining us and they were unable to hear um, your background story uh, because of the sound issues we were having. Do you mind just briefly <laughs> going back and telling your story again? Hello? Did I lose you again? Oh. And can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Okay. okay. So um, my story is actually quite unique, I think, from most people who have. In Southeast Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was homeless when she was pregnant with me. And um, this is right during the height of the crack era. So my mother was addicted to drugs. I've never met my father. He was incarcerated, actually. And 
that I'm currently through this organization called Black Data Processing Associates. Mm -hmm. And this is right around the dot com burst, if you will. But I realized that I had a strong affinity towards computers and technology. So ultimately, I, I went really, really hard. Um, ended up going to Stanford got an engineering degree, worked for Microsoft for five years, went to MIT, blah, 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 the whole dog and pony show. And at the end of it, um, I interviewed with Google, who told me that I was still underqualified for a technical role mm -hmm. with their company. But this is the same company that um, this is a little known fact. Google has 55,000 employees that has less than 20 African-American women in technical roles mm -hmm. because they claim that we're so underqualified. Um, and so here I am uh, interviewing and, and trying to get in and, and they tell me that I'm underqualified. So that's when I realized that I needed to build something. I, I And I think that's like the fundamental mm -hmm. flaw. And uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're going still going just a little bit in and out, but I heard the last part. So that's when you needed to build something. Right. Um, so that's, that's how I realized they're not going to respect us until we build something technical. Yeah. And that is what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to come off as another nonprofit. I'm not Absolutely. trying to come off as a purely social impact. I want to somehow prove that not only women, but a black woman can build a technical product that solves a problem, a global problem. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, I don't think they will take us seriously. Yeah. So, do you find that a lot? Do you find that a lot where a lot of people think just because you're working? Entity that it should be basically a free or um, or a nonprofit uh, product, or basically um, the efforts that you put into it shouldn't be valued in terms of a, a monetary. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I um I was at an event where Dave McClure, he's the uh, founder of Five Hundred Startups. I approached him mm -hmm. and I gave him my pitch. He is only he dismissed me altogether. Like oh, wow. there's no because it's it's all pattern matching, right? They have mm -hmm. yet to see a black woman, a black person, woman, whatever, create a product that appeals to the masses, like Google, like Facebook, mm -hmm. like Microsoft, like Dell, like HP, right? Mm -hmm. So, I my goal in life, and I, I only have about 70 years left, but my goal <laughs> in life is to show that we can create products that appeal to more than just the demographics of our community. Mm -hmm. Like, I can create a product that white boys like. That's, mm -hmm. that's real, but we haven't done that yet. Right. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Okay. Um, so, so there's there was a recent article that I read um, that featured you in, it, and you talked about tokenism in in Silicon Valley. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting. Uh, that you, because it was the first that I heard someone probably be direct about about some things that are happening here. Uh, and just for like clarification, like what do you view as to tokenism? Mm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you're like asking me a question that's a little controversial. I, but I, I, I'm just, I just want, I, I mean, not examples, but just like, what do you view as tokenism? Um, 
I view tokenism in general as when you you pull out someone mm-hmm. from a certain underrepresented demographic mm-hmm. as being extraordinary, mm-hmm. um, knowing that they aren't. <laughs> We are going to put them on a pedestal to show that we, Mm -hmm. you know, the whole I have a, my best friend's black kind of of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Just to prove a point, not exclusionary. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, a token is rarely um, extraordinary. They are a representation of making a majority population feel secure about their Mm -hmm. um, lack of being exclusionary. But I think there's a lot more of us who are not tokens Mm -hmm. that they will never make us tokens Mm -hmm. because were potentially a threat um, to their beliefs around pattern matching. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you did a great job <laughs> in answering that. Okay. I, know it I was trying to be politically correct. <laughs> you did a good job in answering it. I mean, I thought it was still very direct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so there is uh, there's a question that just came in and saying that, you know, token, tokenism as problematic as it is, is there any way that you can use it to your advantage? Ooh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so the tokens that are out there are very visible. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be visible. And a lot of people think that it's my disadvantage of not being visible, mm-hmm. but I intentionally, because I see the advantage of not being a token, um, because I, I think there are people who will create products, will create services that, again, show we're, at the end of the day, regardless of skin color, we can create, we can make disruptive technology. We don't need to be on the cover of Forbes or Black Enterprise Mm -hmm. or this or that. Um, So I, I think it's, it it works to my advantage because I don't need, the people who are really doing things don't need to be in the forefront, but they are going to make it happen in a big way and the people that really matter will recognize it. So how would you, um, would you say that, you know, we talked about there's a lot of people who are extremely visible. Um, Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's part of like a marketing or branding strategy that can help a company grow? And if we refuse, if not, if we choose not to be visible, do we ultimately hurt the growth of our company? That's a great question. Um, I think visibility happens in different ways. Okay. So there is the, like I said, to be in Forbes 30 under 30 or 40 under 40 and blah, blah, blah. There's that sort of visibility. Mm-hmm. I personally want to be visible amongst the kids who live in Southeast DC and Brooklyn and East Palo Alto and Oakland. Like, I want to be more visible to them than I want to be visible amongst the Andreessons mm-hmm. and the Kleiner Perkins and the, you know, because I think that has more of an impact on my community. Mm-hmm. But I do see, you know, if, if I have a company that's trying to raise money why I need to appeal to the Andreessen's, but it's, it's different. Visibility is different for sure. My visibility, I think is more so focused on how am I going to encourage this? You know, like they said, by 2040, 51% of the population is going to be black and brown. I'm more so, I'm more so focused on them. 
how how can I encourage and inspire them than I am the the other side of it? Okay. I mean that 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 is a, that's a good point, and I think it's a it's a balance in terms of um, depending on your your goal and your focus, um, and just I don't know. I think it really depends on where you're coming from. Like, because I, I think I'm of the opinion of you, like where my community really matters to me and having that impact in that community is very important. Um, however, at the same time, um, one can argue that um, having allies um, in other communities work as well, especially, you know, at the current state uh, of, of I would just say the black the black community is that we're so economically disadvantaged as a whole compared mm -hmm. to majority communities. So a lot of a lot of I hate to say this, but a lot of our uh, culture is still dependent on um, allies in the majority community. Is that a fair thing to say? <laughs> no, that's totally. I understand. It's balance, right? Yeah, right. And I think. So I understand the balance. I mean, again, your organization, which is what I love about it, mm -hmm. HBCU starts. So you're you're understanding the importance of these universities. Like all of this has I am the product of HBCU. My mother went to Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. But I went to Stanford and MIT. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to HBCU. But that's mm -hmm. like my my roots are based there. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance for me of understanding like, yes, I do need to appeal to the folks who are in the valley, but also though amongst the people who are being. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, we just got another question that just came in. Uh, B wants to know how does one get on board with I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, uh, how does one get on board with Blendor via internships and or employment while you keep a low profile? So you can go to our landing page. There's a really big button that says sign up. Mm -hmm. And you put in your email address and we will give you the link to our beta. And how, how has the feedback been so far with, with Blendor? So far, it's been really good on the enterprise side, but I want way more feedback on the consumer side. Mm -hmm. So the next couple months or so, when we give you access, I really hope folks will be very candid about what they like and don't like, because ultimately, companies realize the value of getting diverse candidates. But mm -hmm. some, for some reason, women and minorities are not overly eager to apply for a job at Google and at Facebook and at Twitter. So that's, that's what I really want to um, figure out, how we can get more folks here in DC and New York and Atlanta to come to San Francisco. Have you, from the people that you've worked with or talked to so far, what has been that challenge in terms of why do women and minorities not want to apply uh, for positions at the big companies like Google or Twitter? Um, what What are some of the things that you've heard? Um, part of it is family, like just the idea of leaving your family to go so far away. Another part of it is is this. Um, culture, this perception that you're once you you'll get there, but once you get there, you won't be valued. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to change that. Granted, it's a it's a chicken and egg problem, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, um, you know, if you don't have the culture there, people are gonna leave. But if people leave, you're not gonna get people to come. So <laughs> it's a really big challenge. I I really wish um, folks would see, like it's it's kind of like the new gold rush, right? Like yeah. you just need to come and create what you want and stay. Mm -hmm. The problem is people aren't staying. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that dynamic that I'm hoping to change long term. I wrote I wrote a blog post maybe a couple of weeks ago, and it was motivated by um, Leslie Miley in his uh, story yes, uh, with his Twitter, departure yeah. from from Twitter, and the it was motivated based on at this point from hearing a story, I've seen a lot of blacks on social media basically post and say, oh, that's why I'm not working for Twitter or I don't want to do this or um, just because I don't want to deal with the nonsense at some of these companies. Uh, so do you believe that um, as a whole that we should be taking our talent to these larger tech companies or should we remain more insular and start building our own companies? May have lost you again. Hello. Hello, are you there? Okay, it looks like we're still having technical difficulties. Okay. So Stephanie just texted me and she said that she's still having difficulties with her sound and that she's gonna actually try to dial in um, to the call. Let me see if I can actually call her. Okay. Can you see me? Okay. Here? Yeah, I can okay. see you. Um, do you want to just do the uh, sound again or? Whatever works. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's do sound only just in case because I know you're uh, traveling. So you were asking me about? About should, uh, basically, should should Blacks go and work for companies like Google or Twitter, or should we um, keep our efforts within the community and build our own companies? I don't think so. My answer personally, and honestly, mm -hmm. I don't think everyone is cut out for the startup life. It's, mm -hmm. it's a huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter is very unique, Twitter and Instagram, actually. And I actually went to undergrad with the founder of Instagram. So these <laughs> these companies are the, their content is produced, as you know, by fifty percent of their content is produced by brown and black people. Yet they have no representation of such people in their board. Right. Um. And they don't care to. They don't see the sig. They don't see the importance of it. But. I think eventually they will. And I want us to be more proactive in showing them the importance of having that representation. Um, but in terms of starting companies, I think there's a sort of, there's a sort of disillusionment of, you know, like it's really easy to start a tech company, even though I don't know how to code. But if you look at a lot of these these founders, like they're very engineering centered. So I, I, I'm I, reluctant to tell people to just, you know, just start shit on their own, you know, regardless of their engineering um, capabilities. But at the same time, just recognizing that you are contributing to companies that do not represent you. Mm -hmm. So my own personal advice um, across the board is is either learn to code or do what you can to get active in this space because it's real mm -hmm. it's real we're in the information age our grandparents succeeded from the industrial age and right now we're in the information age so if you don't want to learn to code 
that's fine. Learn to design, learn to get in business development or what have you, but get active in it. Um, but otherwise, you know, there, there, there are opportunities um, that I don't think we're taking advantage of, even though people are capitalizing on us. Yeah. Which, <laughs> which um, I don't think we realize. Yeah, they. Instagram, I think the they call it a modern day. Pl- yeah, uh, I think they call periscope. it the modern day plantation. <laughs> right. These people are capitalizing on our nature to be so social, mm-hmm. but we aren't capitalizing on it. And that is more frustrating to me than anything. Absolutely. So we have roughly about. 15 minutes left, but I wanted to, I did want to take the time to talk about one, your amazing success this year, um, being startup of the year. Uh, also, I mean, I've seen you pitch a number of times and you're just kind of, you're flawless when you pitch. <laughs> I, I've seen you pitch a couple of times. Um, and, and so I, for those who are like starting up, um, you know, pitches are very important. What are some of the strategies that you can share? Um, and I don't know, you probably have the number in terms of how many startup competitions you've actually have been successful at this year. Uh, could, you, could you share some of that in some of your strategy in terms of pitching? Sure. So I've probably done about 10 pitch competitions mm-hmm. and I've only lost two. Um, <laughs> A lot of it has to do with practice. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny because I'm I'm a part of an organization called Startups Illustrated. Oh yeah. And um, the coach of it showed us this video of Alan Iverson who was talking about practice, practice, mm-hmm. practice, practice. If you talk to me on the street and you're like, okay, give me your elevator pitch, it will not be as polished as when I get on stage. <laughs> when I'm on stage. I'm like Beyonce, like my shit is tight. (laughs) Like, and that's how you have to think. Like, if you know investors are in the room or people who can ultimately change the trajectory of everything you're doing, you have to be tight. Mm -hmm. No ums, no this, no that. Like, you have to be tight. And so it almost feels like a performance to me whenever I do a pitch competition. So Sasha Fierce um, comes on stage. Say that again? So, so Sasha Fierce comes on stage. Yes. <laughs> and I listen, I, I, I listen to Beyonce a lot mm-hmm. before I go on stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to have that mentality. Like, this is my business. I know what I'm doing. I know the numbers. Numbers, numbers, numbers. And this is a challenge for a lot of women. I don't know how many women are in your audience in particular. Mm-hmm. We tend not to um, focus on the quantitative aspects of our business, mm-hmm. but if you're asking for money, you need to know the numbers. Yeah. So just being able to like, if anyone asks, not even what you pitch, being prepared for the questions that they're going to ask you and to be able to answer them with numbers is very important. Yeah. Um, and so that's something you have to prepare for. It's, I think for me, like, you know, just understanding how it is to be in a male dominated environment where it's so competitive, it's so quantitative driven, it's helped me a lot. And I, I really want to impress upon women the importance of that for sure. And we actually have a, we have a few questions that just came in. Okay. Um, one question uh, from from Alston. He says, "How did you initially start getting companies interested in recruiting from your app?" Oh, so it's actually really it's actually really easy. So in twenty four January twenty fourteen, Intel had just announced that they were committing three hundred million dollars to diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, And then Facebook, Google, Apple, Apple committed $50 million, Google committed $150 million. So 
it made it very easy for me with and this is my second startup so I will tell you it's a lot of different it's it's a huge validation when companies are already committing a budget right to focus on what you're doing versus having to convince them that what you're doing is important so I have met with some companies who are like ah this diversity thing I don't really see the value in it. That's that like by Felicia moment. Like, all right. <laughs> That's cool. But there are a lot of companies who get it. So if you're able to create a business where you already know there's a need and companies are creating a budget to address that need, that's golden. Yeah. 100%. That's golden advice right there as well. <laughs> uh, and then, so then I have, Another question that just came in, uh, in terms of how is the job market for the long-term unemployed with Blender? So if someone's been unemployed for a long t- time, um, is there, could, they, could they use the Blender uh, app uh, to, to find employment? That's actually a great question. Because unlike any other tool, we don't really show, there's, there's no, um, mechanism that highlights gaps in your employment. Mm. So we're only showing companies like, do you have the skills that match the requirements of their job? Because mm. believe it or not, that's how a lot of a lot of these tech companies hire. I've been in, at Microsoft. There are people who didn't graduate college, let alone, you know, so. I want to kind of disrupt this whole resume model, only showing, like, do you have the skills? Do you have the education? Do you have what they want? Can you fulfill? And absent of gender and race, and if you got pregnant and took off for three years, or even if you were incarcerated, like, whatever your situation is, it's more so, like, can you do the job? And Mm -hmm. that's what I really want to highlight with this app. And then we have another question that says, diversity seems to be a buzzword in tech. So how would you say your startup differs from other startups trying to address issues of diversity and inclusion? That's a great question. Diversity is definitely becoming diluted. Um, For me, it's, I guess for me, it's more so understanding, like, we have bias. Even as an African-American woman, I have bias. So I just want to remove as many barriers to entry for people who are typically overlooked Mm -hmm. as possible, whether it be because you're Black or female or gay or disabled or whatever diversity means. It's just a buzzword. You're right. It's totally a buzzword. But Ultimately, we understand that there are certain groups of people who are not given opportunities because of the way their name sounds or because of their religion or gender or what have you. And I'm just trying to remove that as best as we possible can. And also having data to back it up. Um, and I think that's what differentiates us from a lot of other diversity focused apps is that like we are gathering information that will hopefully change behavior around what people are doing around the space. And so once your once the app actually makes the connection between a company and an applicant, do you have any tips for the applicant in terms of uh, how they actually move forward in the process and find success and land in that role? Mm. I guess the biggest tip that I could offer is just be confident. There's um there's a saying in our community around imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. right? This idea that um you're given an opportunity or you're put in a space where you don't necessarily know that you qualify for or you belong. And that can negatively affect your performance. And that's real. So I think more of us need to understand that we belong. 
were qualified. And despite all the images that suggest otherwise, you need to bring forth your the best of you, regardless of of what external influences are saying about you. Um, so, and, and yeah, that's honestly the best advice I can give. Overcome this imposter syndrome by far. Okay. See if there's any more questions. Uh... I, I have a um I have a question. So what's next? For me? For Blender? Yeah, for Blender. So quite a bit. Um <laughs> what really encourages me is um to see like the Prime Minister of the UK deciding that all college applications are nameless and government jobs. So I want to make sure that we are not pigeonholed into being like this diversity only thing. I want to focus on just creating tools that ensure that people of whatever background are given opportunities. So we are focused on tech companies right now, diversity in tech. Soon we'll be branching out, branching out vertically. So to finance companies. Um, I got an email from, from Capital One, from Walmart, from um, Hyatt Enterprises. Um, so I wanna do as much as we can to understand like there is a huge opportunity for getting talent from people that you don't perceive to be qualified. And yeah, that's my goal. And and using data to drive that. Um, so part of my app, I tell people, is like, we want to become like the Netflix of career development. So basic, basically saying, you know, oh, Hadia, we, we noticed you like these past 100 jobs, but here's a tech, this is a, a core technology that you're missing, but here's a course that you can take at General Assembly, at Galvanize, at Khan Academy, that can better align you for the types of jobs that you seem to like. So driving behaviors that get people more aligned with what they want to pursue without without this idea that you have to graduate from Stanford or, or do this or do that. Because I think it's, it's, it's one of those um, things that is prime for disruption. Um, and I want to create a, a platform that makes that happen. So we have one final question before before we let you go. Uh, what it's higher underrepresented candidates starts at the higher manager level. In the Bay Area, many higher managers don't seem open or comfortable around diverse candidates. How does how does Blender address this? Okay. Ask me that one more time. Okay. So hiring underrepresented candidates starts at the hiring manager level. In the Bay Area, many hiring managers don't seem open or comfortable around diverse candidates. Um, how or does Blendor actually address this? So Blendor addresses it in that we are adopting a very simple model for people to buy in. Um, so you're getting people from Tennessee, you're getting people from Alabama, you're getting people from, you know, Clark Atlanta, from Howard, from Cheney, from schools and, and areas that you would have never heard of because it's so simple. But these people understand that the only companies that are on our platform are valuing those individuals. So unlike, you know, any other any other tool, whether it be LinkedIn or Monster or Hired or Dice or whatever recruiting platform you're using, Blendor is, and our tagline is diversity on purpose, right? So we're only showing and marketing this app to communities where you know, like, we want you. We value you. And and it's not just lip service. Like, 
we understand that having you in our company is going to contribute to our bottom line. And that's what I want to convey on both sides of the table. Well, we are about time. Um, And so just final thoughts. Uh, I know we want people to go and check out the the app, sign up for the private beta. And then you mentioned also once they get on on it to actually provide honest feedback. Uh, Any other final thoughts or anything else before we go? Um, I guess final thoughts would be um, I I think more so than any anyone because of my background, where I've come from and, and where I've been, I'm not um, the typical Ivy Leaguer or whatever. Like I, I was born on welfare and have, have worked so hard to be where I am. So I want to impress upon anyone, like, just be confident about what you can do um, and where you can go and understand that these companies truly, the companies particularly that we're targeting, truly value what you can bring to these organizations. So do not shortchange yourself. Do not feel as though you have nothing to bring because you don't have a computer science degree from Stanford or this from Harvard or whatever. Just put forth your best and they understand the value in you and we and we and they want you. So that's I think a lot of companies are having difficulty communicating and branding themselves that way, but I really want to um, make that impression. So that's it. Well, thank you. Um, I'm really glad that you were able to join. I know you're always on the road traveling and doing your thing. Um, hopefully when you're back in the Bay, we'll get a chance to hang out a little bit. (laughs) So, but thank you again. Um, and I just want to thank everyone else who joined for, for asking some really great questions. And I guess I'll see you guys in two weeks. We'll be back in two weeks with another interview. All right. Bye. Thanks.